That moment when you find a game that really speaks to you is kind of magical. When the themes, the atmosphere and the music all just click. A Necrobarista really clicked. It's such a cozy experience, always playing with a tiny hint of melancholy. Mix in a general theme about death and dealing with it, and top it all off with some really hipster characters. And you got something that seems to hit all the right buttons, at least for me, despite it being a visual novel. I really don't like visual novels, or at least usually. More and more keep sneaking into my favorite games and I don't know for how long I can keep denying it. Hi, my name is Greg. Welcome to my grand game library. Necro Barista, developed by Route 59, takes place in the Terminal, a beautiful cafe in Carlton, Victoria, in Australia. In the year 3053, no, wait, that's the postal code of Carlton. <laughs> I'm glad they included that. Throughout my whole first playthrough, I was so confused why a game set so far in the future had basically no sci-fi elements to it. I will always love the aesthetic of a cafe. It appeals to the little closeted hipster within myself. Which might be strange, since I don't like coffee. No, I don't like coffee! The Terminal is a cafe that doubles as a last stop for the departed. The Terminal operates on three basic rules. We welcome both living and dead. Don't ask who's alive. And the dead have 24 hours. That sets the basic premise for the story. A bar where the dead can spend their last 24 hours on Earth before they have to move on. As the terminal's doors open for the first time, we meet Kishan, or Kishan, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, so I'm just gonna call him Kishan. A young man for whom it hasn't quite set in yet that he has died, leaving friends and loved ones behind. He doesn't know how he died or how his boyfriend might be taking it. After all, you don't get a lot of practice in dealing with your own demise. Lucky for him that the staff of the terminal is very well versed in helping the deceased to cope. Doesn't stop him from having a breakdown first though. When he enters, the only person to notice him is the terminal's newly appointed owner, local barista and necromancer Maddie. Maddie styles herself as a bit of a bully, coming across as very abrasive to customers. The attentive ones and the regulars look right past all that though, and see her for the person she really is. She gets annoyed easily, but once she cares for someone, she will go above and beyond for them, even if she could never admit that. She's a perfectionist and will never back down from a challenge. Whether that's mixing the perfect drink for a picky guest or defying the natural order via necromancy. Having worked here for a long time under her mentor Che, she has developed a sixth sense for when it comes to recognizing when someone dead walks through those doors. She takes pity on the dead, and often can't stand to shoot someone out before they're ready to move on. She will often allow them to stay longer than they're allowed to. And what happens when a spirit consumes more life energy than they're allowed to? It upsets the balance that is so carefully maintained by the Council of Death, a seemingly unstoppable force of bureaucracy that will reclaim those hours wasted. Extra hours used by guests of the terminal are put on its tab, building up Maddie's huge hour debt that is at this point already insurmountable. Lucky for Maddie that hours are usable as currency. Having built a small gambling ring around five finger fillet and billiards, she scams hours out of unsuspecting spectres giving them hope that they may not have to pass over just yet, before crushing that hope and taking the hours after she mops the floor with them. As long as they agree to the terms, she doesn't have any qualms about it, much unlike her mentor Che, despite his own rule-bending and necromantic endeavors that let him get upwards of a few hundred years old, he doesn't condone tricking people into shortening their afterlives. Che is recently giving Maddie the keys to the terminal after having taught her everything he knows, besides friendly customer service that is. 
He has worked closely with the Council of Death in the past and enjoys some leeway for his, the Terminals and by extension Maddie's shenanigans. It also helps that one of the Council's enforcers is one of his oldest friends. Now, that helmet may be familiar to some of you. This is Ned. Ned Kelly, to be exact. Real Australian outlaw and folk hero. Learning about history in my video games? Disgusting. Ned has been working for the Council for quite some time and has turned out to be a real stickler for rules. The Council protects the balance of life and death, so a young naive necromancer blatantly undermining every rule in the book really gets under his skin. If it wasn't for Che, he would have likely shut down the terminal a long time ago. A debt like that isn't easily paid back. And I really love how much emotion they're able to convey just by manipulating the slit of Ned's helmet. He's honestly my favorite character. Just like the real Ned Kelly, he's done some awful things in his life and he's trying to repent by doing some good in his afterlife. He constantly hovers around the terminal, keeping a watchful eye on things, especially Maddie. Underneath all that though, Ned is a big softy, although just like Maddie, he could never admit something like that. But Maddie might not be the real threat hiding in the terminal. An evil lurks in its walls, a fiend that if encountered at the wrong time may spell doom for all. So this is Ashley, goblin, gremlin and true genius when it comes to engineering. With just 13 years of age, she's a gifted child that just kinda hangs out at the terminal. She's taking a liking to Maddie and Shay, and uses the terminal as a base of operations of sorts for her own projects. From further studying machines, to knife throwing and building her own sentient crab robots out of trash and soul essence. Like any normal child would really. Those crab robots banter with each other after every chapter, commenting on the events or philosophizing together in a clear homage to Ghost in the Shell's own philosophizing crab robots. Every scene with Ashley is a true delight. Her chaotic character and constant antics make her a joy to watch. Having grown up in and around the terminal, she's used to interacting with dead people and saying goodbye to new friends all the time does seem to get easier. Which is good, since she's gotten really attached to her favorite newly dead Keishan. With this colorful cast of characters, and some side characters that get about half of chapter 5 dedicated to them, we follow the happenings inside the terminal for the duration of Kishin's stay. A lot can happen in a very limited time, and for the sake of spoilers I won't go into that just yet, but every character goes way deeper than these earlier descriptions convey and I really recommend picking this game up to explore them fully. It's a story about life and death, dealing with it, accepting it and finding the resolve to move on. The fear of death is a major motif throughout the game. No one can ignore this most primal of fears. Che and Ned both fought tooth and nail for hundreds of years to not have to move on. Ned by taking up a position with the council, and Che using necromancy to extend his life. Keishan is deathly afraid as well, spending a lot of time drunk or contemplating and ultimately overstaying as well. And Maddie gets it too which is why she lets dozens of deceased stay past the expiration date. Only Ashley, being perhaps too young, naive or too used to it, seems mostly fine and deals with the amount of death around her in a surprisingly mature way. Or maybe it's just too much, since she seems to be dealing with demons of her own. I'll talk about some spoilers now, so skip to here if you don't want to be spoiled. Continuing in 3, 2, 1. Che is dead, and Maddie killed him. He has been dead for several days. A ritual that was supposed to summon enough hours to pay for the terminal's debt 
went wrong, and when it backfired on Mary, Che took the hit and paid for it with his life. When his spirit arrived in the terminal, he helped bury his body and went on as if nothing happened. It's the big elephant in the room that no one wants to address. Everyone apart from Kishin and the player knows what happened, but no one wants it to be real. Their friend, mentor and kind of father figure had seemed to be this eternal being that refused to die for hundreds of years, taken, but still present and acting like everything is okay. Everyone here is aware how painful it is for a soul to stick around past the 24 hours. Yet Che puts on a smile and tries to ignore it. This tension is just barely noticeable throughout the story, subtly hinting at something being off. Maddie is riddled with guilt. Che doesn't want people to be upset and Ned is both terrified and furious over losing his best friend due to Maddie's mistake. Maddie insists on repeating the ritual this time summoning the hours to have Che stay, having Ashley help again who's starting to break down over the expectations that she mostly put on herself. Being a gifted child and suddenly failing don't mix well. And as the ritual starts looking like it will fail again, Che stops it. He refuses to even chance letting someone risk their life just to extend his already bloated lifespan. Even though nothing terrifies him more, he tries putting on a brave face and says he's ready to move on, but on the inside he's screaming, looking for just a few hours more. But that's only so long a soul can overstay their welcome. Even Ned drops the tough guy act on their final goodbye. The ending had me in tears pretty much from the moment we learn of Jay's current state. The cast kind of shares the five stages of grief between them in the final chapters, although a bit out of order. First everyone ignores what happened while plotting to bring Jay back. When Maddie refuses to give up, Jay snaps at her. And with those feelings out in the open, everyone can start moving towards acceptance. Gameplay-wise, there really is much to say. It's a visual novel after all. The most exciting gameplay is walking around the terminal in between chapters to read one of the many short stories hidden all around. Those short stories, those memories as they're called, are just as well written as the rest of the game, if not more so, and are definitely worth seeking out. My favorite being the three-part story of The Fisherman. Even though all you do is press next to advance the story, I was completely transfixed on both of my playthroughs. I'm usually a pretty gameplay focused guy. It's the only truly cinematic visual novel I know of. Every shot carefully crafted wallpaper material. The interplay of lighting, staging, camera movement and albeit sparingly used animation turned Necrobarista into a weirdly unique experience. And let's not forget the music. You've been hearing it throughout this video. But this soundtrack composed by Kevin Penkin of Made in Abyss and Florence fame has done it again and crafted a perfect accompaniment to the story being told. So good, I love it. Oh. What else can I say? Get this game. Support this developer. Route 59 has already announced free bonus chapters coming in 2021, so there's no better time to pick it up. Get cozy, grab some tissues and dive right in. You won't regret it. Whoa, hey, you made it to the end of my first video. Crazy. Thank you so much. I spent way too long on this, but this was fun, so I'm gonna I'm go make more. You know what to do if you want to stay up to date. My name has been Greg, and welcome to my grand game library. Let's see how deep this thing goes. The next one will be wildly different tonally, so get ready. <laughs>